If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. We're starting on page 24. It was like there was nothing, nothing, nothing you could ever hope to say to her unless you wanted to pass through the hands of a living God. And he would check it out with her before he answered you. The mercy seat. She led us to the front row and sat us down before it. She made us sit, but she knelt on her knees. I mean, in front of her seat and bowed her head and covered her eyes, making sure she didn't mess with that veil. I stole a look at Fanny, but Fanny wouldn't look at me. Mrs. Hunt rose. She faced the entire congregation for a moment and then she modestly sat down. Somebody was testifying, a young man with kind of a reddish hair. He was talking about the Lord and how the Lord had dyed all the spots out of his soul and taken all the lust out of his flesh. When I got older, I used to see him around. His name was George. I used to see him nodding on the stoop or on the curb. And he died of an overdose. The congregation amend him to death. Amen him to death. A big sister in the pulpit in her long white robe jumped up and did a little shout. They cried, help him, Lord Jesus, help him. And the moment he sat down, Another sister, her name was Rose, and not much later she was going to disappear from the church and have a baby, and I still remember the last time I saw her. When I was about 14, walking the streets in the snow with her face all marked and her hands all swollen and a rag around her head and her stockings falling down, singing to herself, stood up and started singing. How did you feel when you come out the wilderness leaning on the Lord? Then Fanny did look at me, just for a second. Mrs. Hunt was singing and clapping her hands, and, I kind, and a kind of fire in the congregation mounted. Now I began to watch another sister, seated on the other side of Fanny, darker and plainer than Mrs. Hunt, but just as well-dressed who was throwing up her hands and crying, Holy, 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 bless your name, Jesus, bless your name, Jesus. And Mrs. Hunt started crying out and seemed to be answering her. It was like they were trying to outdo each other, and the sister was dressed in blue, dark, dark blue, and she was wearing a matching blue hat. The kind of hat that sits back, like a skull cap, and the hat had a white rose in it, and every time she moved, it moved. Every time she bowed, the white rose bowed. The white rose was like some weird kind of light, especially since she was so dark and in such a dark dress. Fanny and I just sat there between them, while the voices of the congregation rose and rose and rose and rose around us. Without any mercy at all, Fanny and I weren't touching each other, and we didn't look at each other, and yet we were holding on to each other, like children in a rocking boat. A boy in the back, I got to know him later too, his name was Teddy, a big brown-skinned boy, heavy everywhere except just where he should have been. Thighs, hands, behind, and feet, something like a mushroom turned upside down, started singing. Blessed quietness, holy quietness. What assurance in my soul, sang Mrs. Hunt. On the stormy sea, sang the dark sister on the other side of Fanny. Jesus speaks to me, sang Mrs. Hunt. And the billows cease to roll, sang the dark sister. Teddy had the tambourine, and, he, and this gave the cue to the piano player. I never got to know him, a long, dark, evil-looking brother, with hands made for strangling, and with those hands he attacked the keyboard like he was beating the brains out of someone he remembered. No doubt the congregation had their memories, too. 
and they went to pieces. The church began to rock and rocked me and Fanny too, though they didn't know it and in a very different way. Now we knew that nobody loved us, or now we knew who did. Whoever loved us was not here. It's funny what you hold on to to get through terror when terror surrounds you. I guess I'll remember until I die that black lady's white rose. Suddenly it seemed to stand straight up in that awful place. And I grabbed Fanny's hand. I didn't know I'd grabbed it. And on either side of us, all of a sudden, the two women were dancing, shouting the holy dance. The lady with the rose had her head forward and the rose moved like lightning around her head. Our heads and the lady with the veil had her head back. The veil, which was now far above her forehead, which framed that forehead, seemed like a sprinkling of black water, baptizing us and sprinkling her. People moved around us to give her room, and they danced into the middle aisle. Both of them held their handbags. Both of them wore high heels. Fanny and I never went to church again. We have never talked about our first date, only when I first had to go and see him in the tombs and walked up those steps and into those halls. It was just like walking into church. Now that I had told Fanny about the baby, I knew I had to tell Mama and Sis, but her real name is Ernestine. She's four years older than me and Daddy and Frank. I got off the bus and I didn't know which way to go, a few blocks west to Frank's house or one block east to mine. But I felt so funny. I thought I'd better go home. I really wanted to tell Frank before I told Mama, but I didn't think I, I could walk that far. My mama's a kind of strange woman, so people say... And she was 24 when I was born, so she's past 40 now. I must tell you I love her. I think she's a beautiful woman. She may not be beautiful to look at, whatever the freak that means in this kingdom of the blind. Mama started to put on a little weight. Her hair is turning gray, but only way down on the nape of her neck in what her generation called the kitchen, and in the very center of her head, so she's gray visibly only if she bows her head or turns her back, and God knows she doesn't often do either. If she's facing you, she's black on black. Her name is Sharon. She used to try to be a singer, and she was born in Birmingham. She managed to get out of that corner of hell by the time she was 19, running away with traveling band, but more especially with the drummer. That didn't work out because, she, as she says, I don't know if I ever loved him, really. I was young, but I think now that I was younger than I should have been for my age. If you see what I mean, anyway, I know I wasn't woman enough to help the man, to give him what he needed. He went one way and she went another and she ended up in Albany. Of all the places working as a barmaid, she was 20 and had come to realize that though she had a voice, she wasn't a singer. That to endure and embrace the life of a singer demands a whole lot more than a voice. This meant that she was kind of lost. She felt herself going under. People were going under around her. <clears throat> every day and Albany wasn't exactly God's gift to black folks either of course I must say that I don't think America is God's gift to anybody if it is God's days have got to be numbered that God these people say they serve and do serve in ways that they don't know has got a very nasty sense of humor. Like you beat the, sh the shoot out of him if he was a man or if you were. In Albany, she met Joseph, my father, and she met him at a bus stop. She had just quit her job and he had just quit his. <coughs> Uh, 
He's five years older than she is, and he had been a porter in the bus station. He had come from Boston, and he was a really was really a merchant seaman, but he had sort of got himself trapped in Albany mainly because of his older of this older woman he was going with then who really just didn't dig him going on sea voyages. By the time Sharon, my mother, walked into that bus station with her little cardboard suitcase and her big scared eyes, things were just about ending between himself and this woman. Joseph didn't like bus stations, and it was the time of the Korean War, so he knew that if he didn't get back to sea soon, he'd be in the army, and he certainly would not have dug that. As sometimes happens in life, everything came to a head at the same time, and there came Sharon. He says, and I believe him, that he knew he wasn't going to let her out of his sight the moment he saw her walk away from the ticket window and sit down by herself on a bench and look around her. She was trying to look tough and careless but she just looked scared he says he wanted to laugh and at the same time something in her frightened eyes made him want to cry